Good morning, church. Um, my name is Julie Bridges, and I'm children's minister here. The scripture we're going to be reading is Exodus 20, 16. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Just a couple of things before I get started. First of all, um, you're here on Labor Day weekend, so that's a notch in your Christian belt, right? Y'all are next level Christians. You made it to church, so uh, congratulations. You've done well with that. The second thing I want to give credit to, Kevin DeYoung wrote a book. Uh, it's just called The Ten Commandments, Little Green Book, that Matt Duke, our campus pastor at our Pecola campus, shared with me that has been absolutely fantastic as we've walked, walked through these Ten Commandments. And so uh, if you're interested in that little green book called The Ten Commandments, Kevin DeYoung, uh, I know you're all going to rush out and get it, but uh, it's, uh, it's an excellent book that I want to give him some credit for all that he's written in there. Uh, I want to begin today uh, by sharing a story with you. It's a story about a man named Randall Adams. Um, in 1977, he was convicted of killing uh, a Dallas police officer. Now, the killing happened as a result of uh, the car being pulled over, uh, driving at night with no lights on. So apparently, as the officer approached the car, um, he was shot there and killed. Now, Adams didn't have a lot of a chance uh, to wiggle his way out of this. There was a 16-year-old eyewitness uh, by the name of David Harris who told police he'd witnessed the shooting. He saw where everything had happened. He was even able to point them toward the car uh, that the guy was driving where they ultimately found the murder weapon. So strike one against him. Also, R.L. and Emily Miller both testified having seen the subject there. The car pulled over on the, the highway with the police officer already behind it just maybe seconds before the shooting occurred. And then um, there was a psychiatrist who did an evaluation of Randall Adams that said not only was he more than capable of killing, but that he would be a menace to society if left alive. And so it didn't take the jury all that long. They deliberated. They found him uh, guilty in, of murder in the first degree. They ultimately sentenced him to death. Now, there was an appeals process, the Texas Criminal Court of Appeals. They unanimously upheld his conviction, and he was scheduled um, to face the death penalty. Now, a number of years later, a documentary came out um, on this very specific crime. And what they concluded was that uh, what had happened to Randall Adams was a miscarriage of justice. It was a tragedy. Uh, they concluded that he hadn't um, committed the murder at all. And upon seeing their evidence, the Texas Court of Appeals again took up his case, and they found him not guilty. They totally exonerated him and cleared his name, which is, by the way, the unique part about this story. He was actually scheduled to be executed years and years and years before this, and due to some legal uh, things going on in the state of Texas, he was just kind of left there in prison during this time. So after being in prison for 12 years, he was released, and the Court of Appeals cited a few different things uh, in his acquittal. The first was malfeasance on the part of the prosecutor, a man by the name of Douglas Miller. Uh, he had coerced witnesses. He'd given false testimony or coerced them to give false testimony. Um, there were inconsistencies and lies in the testimony of the Millers who said that they'd seen him there on the side of the road pulled over by the police officer. Um, the psychiatrist who had evaluated him. Um, it turns out that he, too, had given false testimony, even though he was an expert witness, witness. He actually lost his license to practice as a result of his testimony. And then finally, that young 16-year-old boy who said he saw uh, Adams commit this crime, he actually changed his story, too. As a matter of fact, 12 years later, he was himself sitting on death row for a different murder and began to brag to other um, inmates there in the prison that he was the one who had committed the murder. So you might think, my, my goodness, how in the world does something like this happen? All of these different people lied in order to put this man in jail. He should have been executed, but luckily, 12 years later, he was freed. How does this happen? The same way it happens in our lives. Because most of us, we go throughout our days, go throughout our lives, our lives um, and we speak untruths thinking, ah, no big deal, right? Nothing's going to come of this. We shouldn't be worried about it. It's not that big of a thing. It was, a, we might call it a little white line, I, yet I would want you to know that our sins are very significant. They have consequences that we may not see at the moment, but they're very real. And the God of the universe... The Most High God, and when he took the time to speak to Moses on the top of the mountain, give us the Ten Commandments, he took the time and he says, you shall not bear false 
witness. He knew the destructiveness of sin and ultimately wanted to point us toward the narrow path that would lead us to life. So here in Exodus chapter 20, verse 16, we are taught not to give false witness. Now, this is kind of a legal term, you know, legal sense, if you will, bearing false witness. So if you think about when Moses met with God on the top of Mount Sinai, uh, they didn't have CSI investigators. They didn't have fingerprint analysts, DNA technicians to, you know, bring in outside evidence to, to prove the guilt or innocence in a crime. What you had was the testimony of people who may have witnessed this. So um, during this time, they didn't prosecute a whole lot of crimes uh, or they didn't have a trial for many crimes other than capital crimes that would result in death. And so uh, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6 says, On the evidence of two to three witnesses, the one who is able to, the one who is to die shall be put to death. And so you couldn't just have one person that said it. You would need two or three that could all confirm what they would see before someone would be put to death. Now, in this case, the consequences are very clear. False testimony resulted in death. A tragic miscarriage of justice was denied to the one who was ultimately accused but that was innocent. But it also harmed the individual and everyone in the community because trust was broken, justice was not done. It's a tragedy that all began with little, small lies, maybe distorting a little bit, you know, maybe not telling the whole truth, but ultimately it was tragic. Now, as I said here, the vocabulary reflects a legal process, but um, the ninth commandment calls for truth absolute truthfulness in all areas of our lives. And so uh, it's not just merely not lying, but it's also as believers in Jesus Christ, we should be quick to speak the truth. We ought to be candid and open about any relevant details that people might need to know. We can lie by omitting things or withholding truth when it needs to be spoken. But the ninth commandment would have us be absolutely truthful in all areas of life. That's your personal life, your public life, private areas of your life, we should be absolutely truthful in all things. Now, God, who spoke the Ten Commandments, he begins by saying, I am the Lord your God. I am the sovereign over the universe. I'm the most high God who created everything that you know and see. And I'm telling you, if you want to know what life is like, you want to know uh, what the path that I would want you to walk, you should not bear false witness. Part of what we've been called to do as believers, the two great commandments, love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves. And because we love God and we love our neighbor, we should operate in truth. As Christians, as God's people, we reflect His nature and character to the world around us. And wouldn't it be amazing if all of God's people were known as uniquely truthful people, that they would own their mistakes when they made mistakes, that they would or, you know, be quick to tell the truth, even if it reflected poorly on them, that the rest of the world could say, when you do business with a Christian, you can know that it's going to be up front. They're going to do exactly what they said. They're, they're people of their word. Wouldn't that be a joy? That's actually how it should be for us as believers in Jesus Christ. Absolutely truthful. So you might ask the question, what's the big deal about one little lie? What's the big deal about me being a young man? And my mom says, who drank all the milk and put the carton back in the refrigerator? And me saying, I don't know. Right? It must have been my sister, right? What's the big deal with those little things that we might think are insignificant uh, and we shouldn't worry about? What's the big deal with one little lie? Well, I want to make two propositions um, for you this morning. The first is this that Satan, our enemy, is a liar. John chapter 8, verse 44 says, and this is Jesus, he's speaking to the Pharisees who, by the way, would have considered themselves to be extraordinarily devout religious people. If anybody knew God in their mind, they would have said it was them. They kept the law, they knew the commandments, they could recite the word, like they had it all going on, right? And Jesus, speaking to the Pharisees in John chapter 8, he says, you of, are of your father the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So I want to say this again. Satan is a liar. 
It's in his nature. It's in his character to lie. If you remember in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, God has created the world. He's got, they got plants and animals, the water, the land. Like everything is beautiful. And they have all the food that they can eat. God is providing for them. Adam and Eve get to walk and talk in the garden with God. They're married and they don't fight. Like this was, this was heaven, right? This was Eden, heaven on earth. It was beautiful. There's no sickness, no hurting, no dying, no pain. Like this is great. And then Satan, the liar, the deceiver, right? He comes to Eve and he says, Hey, Eve, did God really tell you that you, can, you, that you shouldn't eat from any tree in the garden, which is not what God said, by the way? And, uh, of course, Eve says, no, no, no. God didn't tell us we couldn't eat from any tree. He told us not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We're not supposed to eat from that one. And if we do, he said we should surely die. And so Satan, who's a deceiver, right? He's a liar. He says, well, surely you won't die. You're not really going to die. You've eaten all these other things. Why would you think that if you eat from that, you're going to die? As a matter of fact... I bet if you eat from that tree, you're going to become like God, knowing good and evil. And what Satan just did was he diminished the consequences of the sin, right? I surely won't die. It's not that big of a deal. It's just one little lie, right? And then he, he heightened what he would consider to be the reward for, for sin. Matter of fact, if you will eat of that, you're going to be like God. You're going to know good from evil. Diminishes the consequences and then dramatically overestimates any sort of benefit, right? And Adam and Eve, they took of that fruit and they ate. And in that perfect world, where Adam and Eve existed in perfect relationship with God and each other, where there was no hurting or dying or death or pain, sin entered in. And there's not a person in this room that hasn't felt the sting of sin in your life, that hasn't been betrayed, that hasn't been mistreated, that hasn't known what it is to experience um, someone lying to them, treating you in a way that wasn't appropriate. Like we live in this profoundly broken world. I want you to know that every single sin is significant. As a matter of fact, what Jesus tells us here, what he told the Pharisees, is that when we participate in falsehood, when we will say something that isn't true, when we'll uh, manipulate or deceive in order to kind of make things be work out better for us, we are doing the work of our enemy, the devil. So Satan is a liar who is bent upon destruction. Jesus tells us that, right? He says, your enemy, the thief, he's come only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And so lying is ultimately going to lead to destruction every single time. And you may not see it at the moment. I doubt Eve knew, hey, I'm going to blow it for all of humanity forever, right? I, I'm going to blow it until one day Jesus comes back, thousands of years in the future. I'm going to make suffering and pain the norm for everybody. She thought, hey, the fruit looks good. And for us, how arrogant would we be, be to think, well, it's not that big of a deal. My sin doesn't really matter. So the first of the propositions is that Satan is a liar who is here for your destruction. And when we walk in falsehood, we do Satan's work. We perpetuate destruction and pain and suffering here. But the second proposition is this, that God is true. Truth is an essential attribute of God's character. Because God is perfect in all of his ways, he is perfect in truth. He is the author of truth. He's the one who ordered the world, right? He made it knowable and discoverable to us. Like we can have scientific breakthroughs because our God has made the world knowable to us. He has given us his word in which we can know truth. We have his spirit to guide us into all truth. And so God himself is completely true. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18 tells us that it is impossible for God to lie. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory as of the only Son from the Father. He is full of grace and truth. In John chapter 14 verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. While Satan is a liar who is bent upon destruction, Jesus is the truth. And he's, he's not bent upon destruction. He says, I, while the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy, I have come that they might have a life and have it to the fullest. And so Satan's a liar who's bent on destruction. Jesus, or God is truth, who wants to lead us to abundance. 
Jesus is like, I want you to know life in my kingdom. The richest, fullest, most satisfying life that you will ever live is the life lived in complete obedience to Jesus. There's not a better option. Satan is a liar. He's bent on destruction. But God is truth. And he's seeking our abundance in this life. When we walk in falsehood, we do the work of Satan. When we walk in the truth, we do God's work. We perpetuate God's goodness and his redemptive purposes in this world. Now, just a step more. Because God exists and he's perfect, right? Because God exists, truth exists. And if God did not exist, truth would cease to exist. I know it's a little bit difficult to grapple with, right? Um, God, by virtue of his being, who he is, his nature and his character, he is truth. And because he exists, truth exists. If God ceased to exist, so would truth. And y'all, we live in a world where everybody's trying to define their own truth and be a truth unto themselves, and what you feel in your heart is what is true, and, and all these sorts of things. What you should see there is that people who walk in that and struggle with it, the world, they are not walking with God. Um, where there is no God, there is no truth. But where we come to know God, we come to experience Him, we know Him, we come to know the truth. And so when we live in a world that seems to be in such chaos and confusion around what is absolutely true, uh, we should know that we live in the midst of a world that does not know God. So we should be compassionate for that, and we should be very careful that we don't perpetuate falsehood in our broken world. So the playbook of our enemy, it has one play in it, right? It's deceit in order to destroy over and over and over and over. God is truth, though, and we can walk in the truth. So I'm going to give you kind of the main idea of the sermon. We will either serve God's redemptive purposes by walking in the truth, or we will serve Satan's destructive purposes by walking in falsehood. So what does it look like for us to bear false witness? I've never had to testify at a trial in my life. I don't know about you. Maybe you, you have. I, I did get a jury duty thing one time. I didn't even get called after that. So maybe I'm off the hook for a bit. But I've never had to testify at a trial. I did have to give a police report one time. Um, it was about myself. We can talk about that later. Uh, but otherwise, I've never had to uh, testify or anything like this. But I do know that in every conversation that I engage with and every day, it's an opportunity to speak truth or falsehood. One of the ways that we bear false witness is by just straight up lying, right? We tell lies. This is when we speak something that we know isn't true. Now, we can either affirm lie by affirming that which is not true or by denying that which is true, right? I didn't do it. It wasn't me, right? Let me give you an example, maybe just a really practical way that you might be tempted to lie. Let's say on the way home from church today, you've been at church, right? You're doing the right thing, and you weren't paying such close attention to your speed because you were, you know, texting on your phone or whatever it might have been, uh, and you got pulled over by a police officer, and they ask you that really terrible question that they should never be able to ask, um, do you know why I pulled you over? And you're like, well, yeah, I was speeding and texting while I was driving. Of course I know, but you don't want to answer that, right? You're like, am I going to be honest here? Am I going to be truthful because I don't want to incriminate myself? Or do I want to say, no, I don't know why you pulled me over? Ultimately, as believers, we lie when we deny what is true. That's, that's one thing. Or when we affirm that which isn't true. And God takes our sin very seriously. We bear false witness when we lie. And lying hurts us. Some of you in this room, um, you might continue to battle this day with untruths. With, with lying, because when you were a kid, you were able to lie and you were able to get away with it. And if you're anything like me, when I was a little kid, I would tell lies and I'd sort of get caught, but then I'd tell another lie to cover that one up. And before long, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a giant ball of lies and I can't maintain it anymore. And like, it's getting ugly for me. And, and some of you were able to get by with that in your childhood and you carried those patterns into your adult life. And you feel like people don't even know you because your life is full of lies. There was some years ago a, a coach that got hired to be the head coach at Notre Dame. 
Uh, definitely a good coach. He'd done a lot of great things, but he got fired very shortly thereafter because they found that years prior he'd made up some stuff. He'd lied on his resume and he lost, I mean, one of the top jobs in college football uh, because he wasn't walking the truth. Some of you have grown up in homes or you have friends who didn't walk in the truth. And you bear the scars of that. You have a difficult time trusting people because the people closest to you weren't very trustworthy. And it seems simple for us to just not lie. And yet it's very easy when the pressure's on, when your parents are questioning you and you know you did the thing to, to try to worm our way out and lie. Uh, but ultimately that's not walking in the light that our God has called us to walk in. That's not walking in truth, it's walking in falsehood. And we can always anticipate destruction. Some of you could write the rest of that story. Let me tell you how lying has caused destruction in my life. It's allowed me to perpetuate sin. I've become, you know, hardened to it. So one of the ways that we bear false witness is by telling lies. The, the second way that we can bear false witness is by distorting the truth. Have you ever had an argument with somebody? Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's your boss. Maybe you got fired. I don't know what. Maybe you've just had a conversation with somebody where you were describing a conflict that you had with somebody else. And somewhere along the way, you realize that you know, the way that I'm telling this story, I'm making myself out to be perfect and noble and righteous, and I'm making the other person out to be a, a really terrible, wicked person, right? And, and so we distort the truth when we tell stories to other people we're seeking advice, right? We, when we would relay things to other people, and we would omit or include certain details that, shed, that cast us in a favorable light and someone else in an unfavorable one. We've distorted the truth. We've omitted that which might have made us look bad in the deal in order to gain favor with somebody else. Maybe you're trying to get people on your side. It's bearing false witness. Or maybe for you, this happens when it comes to political issues. And you find that when you're talking with someone on the other side or talking about someone who might be on the other side of the aisle, whichever side that might be, that when you talk about them, um, you present them in the worst possible light. You, you present all of the worst conclusions they could possibly draw. You, you know, kind of frame them in a way that they're all evil and frame your side in that it's all good. It's bearing false witness. It's distorting the truth. When you, in general, have a disagreement with somebody, even face-to-face, -face, do you try to over-represent your righteousness and over-represent their wickedness? Maybe it's even with your spouse. And you find that rather than having a conversation with two, you know, someone and it's just two people agreeing, you find that you're fighting against the other person and you'll employ words or twisting the truth or deception in order to make your point land really well or in order to make you seem like you were right. As believers, when relaying any interaction that we have with one person to another, we should be careful that we are completely honest and candid. We should love our neighbor and seek to represent others as we would want them to represent us. In the midst of a discussion or an argument, you should represent your opponent's ideas in the same way that you would want them to represent yours with charity, charity right? We want to give them the benefit of the doubt rather than paint them in the worst possible light. Now, another way that we can distort the truth is by exaggeration, fellas. Here it goes, right? As guys, we often like to over-represent over our accomplishments and maybe diminish our failures just a little bit, right? We want people to like us and think good things about us. As men, we want to be seen as capable and able, like we can do it. And yet every man in this room, we've got our weaknesses. We have our struggles. We have moments where we blow it in ways that embarrass us, and we think, how in the world could I have missed it? And yet, in our interactions with other people, maybe we're pitching ourselves for a job, you're trying to get whatever it might be, we tend to exaggerate our accomplishments and abilities and diminish our failures. Maybe for you, it's at work and somebody made a big mistake and that somebody was you. And your boss just wants to figure out what happened and you pass blame to somebody else. It's distorting the truth. And maybe the 
your organization doesn't fix what was going wrong and you never confront your, your mistakes and you never grow and get better because you chose to walk in falsehood. What I really wish that you all believed about me or what I really wish was true about me is that uh, I have it all together. Like I, I want people to think about me and think, man, that guy, he is a husband, he's a good husband, he's a good dad, and he's a good pastor. But if I'm just going to be brutally honest with you, I often feel completely unqualified for any of those things. I sit and I pray to God, like, I don't know how to love my wife as you love the church. And man, I really thought that raising kids would be like a thousand times easier than what it is. I thought we'd sit, sit at home and we'd have the kids in a circle and I'd do a Bible study. And, and I've tried that a few times. And, you know, one kid's punching the other and they're watching TV. And I'm like, no, this is not what I hoped for. And then when it comes to church, I thought that I could just be a pastor and everyone would love each other and things would go great. But sometimes it's not true. And there are Sundays that I don't want to stand up here and preach and I'm struggling. I'm saying, God, you should have picked somebody else, right? But I have to trust in his sovereign plan. That's the reality about me. And what I've found is that when we're honest about our reality, other people can't be too. And in any given room of people, we're all struggling. We all have issues. We all have self-doubt. And sometimes for someone else to say that, it's really, really helpful for us to be honest about ourselves. We can all sit in the room and pretend to be okay, or we can be honest about the fact that we, we aren't. So we can bear false witness by lying, by distorting the truth. And the third way is by slandering and gossiping about other people. Slander is very clearly just saying something about someone that we know to be untrue. Maybe in high school, there was that girl, and she was super cute, and you thought she was cuter than you, and so you made up a story about her so people wouldn't like her as much, and maybe they would like you. Or, fellas, maybe for you, um, it was that athlete or the guy that you were competing against, and you would say things about him to demean his character in hopes that it might make you look a little bit better. And I point out that it happens in high school, but it also happens in our 40s, in our 50s, doesn't it? Or maybe we hear something about someone, that juicy bit of gossip about somebody that we know. We don't know if it's true or not, but we know it's going to harm their character. We know it's going to make them look bad before other people. And when we present that, when we gossip about another people, we fail to protect their reputation. We bring harm both to that person and ultimately to the kingdom of God. As the people of God, we should not walk in gossip and we should not walk in slander, but we should walk in absolute truthfulness. People should know that whatever thing that we might hear about them, it's safe with us. If you hear something that's kind of outrageous about somebody, um, the first call you should make is to that person, right? Hey, I've heard this thing. I'm not accusing you of anything. I've heard this thing about you. Um, and I want you to know that True or false, that's safe with me. I'm not going to spread it. I'm not going to defame you. I'm not going to bring shame on your life. Uh, it's safe with me. Now, if it's a Christian brother or sister, they're caught in sin, like you can go and you begin to admonish them, right? You can speak truth to them. But what we're not going to do is talk badly about other people, other people who are made in the image of God who are loved by him enough that Jesus would go to the cross and die that they might find life. God is teaching us how to live and how to walk as disciples, as members of his kingdom. Don't bear false witness. Not even those juicy little tidbits that it feels good to pass along. Not even when it makes your opponent look bad and you look good. Not even when it's going to advantage your career or your family or any other thing. But instead, we walk in utter truthfulness because our God is utterly true. He is perfectly true. And so we reflect his nature and character when we walk in truthfulness. In Ephesians chapter 4, 29, the Apostle Paul said, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. I want you to ask you to think again. Imagine if just the people in this room if we decided from this day forward, we're the people of God, right? And we go out into our community, wherever we might be, and we just obey this. No corrupting talk, but instead only that which is good for building others up. 
only in, in giving grace to other people, right? That they would see that our speech, like, think about what a testimony that is to the world in which we live. Do y'all, are y'all on social media? Y'all watch when something goes down with somebody, how quickly, like, their name is trending on Twitter or whatever, and it, it gets shared all over the world anytime it's bad news? Man, just imagine if there were a group of people who wouldn't let any unwholesome talk come out, but only that which was useful for building up, that we could be grace givers to people. That's what we've been called to. And when we're not that, when we tend to engage in gossip or slander or lying or manipulating or twisting and distorting, Jesus has something to say about that. Matthew chapter 15, verses 19 and 20, he says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts and murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. The things that come out of our mouths ultimately reveal what's in our hearts. And that should really bother us. Imagine if you were on trial and someone just had all of your speech from, say, the last year, and and their aim was to convict you of being guilty of lying. To be honest with you, They wouldn't have to go back very far to have enough to convict me. But I don't always do a good job of protecting reputations or presenting myself in the absolute true light that I'm in in being a grace giver and not letting unwholesome speech come out of my mouth. And Jesus would tell us that when that happens of us, if we would find if we'd be found guilty in that scenario, ultimately it's an issue of our hearts. And then if we want our hearts to be transformed, if we want to stop walking in falsehood, we've got to start walking in the truth. And for us as Christians, the good news is we don't have to transform ourselves. It's not up to us to, you know, have enough self-discipline to quit doing the bad things and to start doing the good things. But instead, what we merely do as believers is we turn to Jesus Christ, our Savior, who understood that we could not live the abundant life on our own, but he instead went to the cross. Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood, and he did it that we might have life and have it to the fullest. 1 John um, 1, 8, 9, it says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And that's a really bad place to be in when you're self-deceived because you believe you're right still, right? And so you don't know that you're wrong, but everybody else might see it. It's a bad place to be. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, I'm a liar. God, I, I gossip about people, and I tear them down, and I ruin their reputations. God, I'm quick to share the terrible news. Lord, I distort the truth. If we confess our sins, He is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, what happens for us when we come to faith in Jesus, when we stop trusting in our own goodness instead, come to trust in Jesus Christ and His work for us, His death on the cross for us, it's not us trying to improve ourselves, but rather in Christ Jesus we're made new creations. Jesus begins this process in us, whereas disciples of Jesus, it's the process of sanctification. Day in and day out, he makes us more and more and more like him through the power of his spirit. As we look into his word, we ask, what does God's word have to say about this, right? And then we ask, would you conform my life to your image? If you're here today, find that you're a liar, you know, that you hurt people. You've defamed people. You have broken relationships. Confess your sins to the Lord. He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Every week at the end of the, our sermon, we offer a time of response for you. And this is where we want to give you a chance to really respond in obedience to whatever God may be leading for you. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, you've never been forgiven of your sins, you've not come to faith in Him, I'll be right down here in just a moment. I would love to visit with you more about the gospel. But if you're here and you see that behind you, in your wake, there's destruction back there. That you've done the work of the enemy rather than the work of God. You've walked in falsehood rather than truth. And what we do as believers is we confess that before the Lord. And we trust that Jesus has taken our sins as far as the east is from the west from us, 
that he will cleanse us, forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So whatever it might look like for you today, I'm going to pray here in just a second. I just want to encourage you to respond in obedience to the God of the universe who said, I am the Lord your God, the God who transforms us, who sets us free from our sins and leads us to new life in him. Would you bow with me? Lord Jesus, um, we continue to thank you that you are a God who's perfect. God, you're unchanging the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, that when you say it, we know that it is true because you're perfectly true. Lord, it's our heart that we would be a people who are used for good, for your redemptive purposes in this world. Would you help us to walk in truth? God, would you help us to turn away from falsehood, that we might not participate in the work of our enemy? Lord, for those in this room who have been hurt by lies and gossip and rumors, things that are untrue, Lord, I pray that you'd bring healing to their hearts, that they might see that people who do such things often don't know God. God, for those who do, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For those who've hurt others, Lord, I pray that today would be a day of redemption, a day of forgiveness, a day of salvation for those who don't know you. So we just invite you to have your way in this room. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now, I'm going to invite you to stand. And whatever God.